Measure. On our. No, I think we can stop. I think we can stop. Okay, so so this morning uh, we have Ricardo Tazzi starting his lectures on also on particle physics for string theory. Thank you. So first of all, thank you for inviting me to give these lectures. Uh, one first comment: uh, the title was not is not a title that was chosen after thinking. It just came up as a joke, and it <laughs> stuck. Okay, so. So I'm, I'm here presenting an apology of my discipline, call it beyond the standard model in front of the future leaders of string theory. So let's, before being burned at stake, then let me, let's wait, let's see how much fire. So um, in fact, uh, the, the a possible title of this course could have been behind and beyond the standard model, okay? And, and I, as, as, as I will explain in a moment. So quantum field theory, we are, we are appro as we are approaching the 90th birthday of quantum field theory, uh, we can only reckon how uh, our progress in understanding of fundamental physics over the last 90, 90 years has really gone hand in hand with the progress in our theoretical understanding of quantum field theory. The, the crown jewel, the coronation of this process uh, is the standard model, a specific quantum field theory uh, that beautifully, remarkably uh, accounts for a multitude of uh, experimental data that have been collected in, uh, in uh, collider, particle colliders over the last 40 decades. And uh, in, in some respects, the standard model is really, is really remarkable. I mean, it has level of precision that were not, not expected when I started doing physics 30 years ago, but it does. So, and uh, but what is perhaps even more remarkable is that uh, side by side at these successes of the standard model, there lie mysteries, paradoxes and tantalizing hints on what could be behind it or beyond it. And uh, I don't need to tell you what these mysteries and paradoxes are. The one and the foremost is that we basically don't understand space-time. We don't understand why we live in a flat and big universe. The zeroth order compute, the first computation you do in quantum field theory when you quantize the Klein-Gordon field the vacuum energy, of course, you find out that it's not calculable, but if you have to guess what the result would be, assuming that someday you would be able to calculate it, it would be completely 
orders and orders of magnitude away from what you really observe. So this is the first computation in, in quantum field theory. So, so when you present it, first you have to encourage students be, wait a moment, and there is also G minus two, there are other things. Uh, but for a while, it's not, it's not easy to keep there. If, if you're honest, okay, if you <laughs> insist on saying that, of course, if you just say, okay, you, you don't say it, nobody will realize in the first lecture, okay? That's precisely quantum field theory. And, uh, and then of a similar nature, the hierarchy problem or the hierarchy paradox, uh, again, I don't need to tell you. We, we don't know uh, what, what, is, what, the, what the matter that makes, the vast majority of the matter that exists in galaxies is made of. And Mariangela is trying, is guiding us through progress towards trying to figure that out. And, and there are also, these are all the mysteries and paradoxes. And there are also tantalizing hints, okay? There are, there are really uh, features of the standard model that speak to us uh, about the fact that we are really missing something, that there is, we are there, there is a structure that is interesting. Take, for instance, gauge interactions, okay? Ordinary gauge interaction, not gravity. Uh, it could have happened that the couplings at ordinary energy, say at the weak scale, were different by a factor of a few with respect to what we really observe. And given that the fact that the couplings evolved logarithmically, it could have been that the couplings never came even approximately close when you extrapolate above or below in energy. As a matter of fact, instead, the couplings are, cho are chosen by nature in such a way that they do come very close within, say, 20%, even in the standard model. And that happens remarkably at an energy scale that is not not so much far away from the energy scale where gravity becomes also uh, important and comparable in strength. It could have happened 80 orders of magnitude above or below. Okay, it happens there. So there is an indication. And very much there are similar indications in the structure of Yukawa couplings and so on. And uh, so my opinion, and I think the opinion of the majority of us, is that if progress will be made on all of these questions, progress will likely be in a, will, uh, will likely force us to go beyond quantum field theory, perhaps along the direction that is being indicated to us by string theory in all its ramifications. Uh, uh, I think that's, uh, that's, uh, that's fair. But I think it's equally fair that uh, there's still plenty of space for progress within quantum field theory. Okay. Dark matter is certainly uh, a case, okay, very likely we'll understand dark matter in quantum field theory. We will not need to go uh, to string theory to understand dark matter. I could be wrong, but I think it's very likely we'll understand it in, st in, uh, in field theory. Very much as we have uh, understanding or explanations, they may not work, uh, about the hierarchy problem within field theory. Okay. Uh, we have understanding about leptogenesis in field theory. We have several things. So there is still <coughs> plenty of work and of possibilities just within quantum field theory. Of course, we have to be open to go beyond. So <coughs> my, my lectures are, are, uh, have, have the aim of giving you <coughs> a perspective on, uh, on, on this field of research that tries to attack some <coughs> of the open problems of particle physics <coughs> within the context of quantum field theory. This is, this is the so-called physics beyond the standard model domain. And uh, uh, my, my, my lectures are basically divided into two parts, okay? And I'd be very, very happy if I get to do the first part because I, I know that I, I typically misestimate the length of my lectures by a factor of three. <laughs> but it depends very much also on how the audience interacts and all that. Okay, so, that. so the first part, which I would call behind the standard model. It's behind. <laughs> so it's, be, it's, be, it's OK. So, and the, the, the items that I will uh, discuss here are 
if you want the effective field theory ideology and naturalness. You need to have an ideology. Okay? Doesn't mean this ideology does not need to coincide with truth, okay? <laughs> and you have to be ready to change it, but you need an ideology, okay? Uh, then I will uh, discuss the standard model as an effective field theory. And its praise. I hope I write correctly. Praise, Z or, or S? Praise, S. Yes, you're right. Okay. Um, so, this is about how beautiful the standard model is. Okay. Um, it's really structurally uh, uh, quite remarkable. And, and it's beautiful, the, 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 the structure, structural remarkability. Uh, of the standard model has very much to is in one-to-one -one correspondence with the effort and the difficulty that people like me are facing in their in their in their activity. Okay, um, and then the third part will be the hierarchy problem. So we found the hierarchy paradox. In fact, the hierarchy paradox uh, it is a paradox because it, it's a formulated as a feature of the standard model. On one side, the standard model is beautiful, and on another side is ugly. And these two sides are very much connected to, to one another. Uh, the, the beauty and the ugliness are the same thing. This is why it's a paradox, OK? It may be a question of taste, but uh, <laughs> and so then there's a second part. And the second part is, if you want more standard, is what I call beyond. And here, I have a choice. And I could go on and on and on. And uh, so I, I just wanted to illustrate to you the two major, uh, two major systems that uh, dominate our understanding uh, concerning the hierarchy problem. And this is supersymmetry and compositeness. I think that even if any of these ideas is not uh, realized as a solution to the hierarchy problem, I, I still think it's worth knowing about them, knowing, appreciating why, what's wrong with them, how they fail, how they how they work. So that's that's uh, okay. So it's not clear to me that I will do everything. Okay, and uh, we will see. Okay. I'd already be happy to do this and part of that. Okay, so, so let me start. Let me start uh, uh, with the first part. Okay. And today I'll basically discuss uh, the effective field theory ideology and uh, introduce the notion of naturalness and of naturally large hierarchies in, in, in field theory. Okay, so. Uh, here I can write. So, <clears throat> since the time of, uh, of, uh, of Wilson, but some pragmatic physicists had this idea before, I think Fermi more or less was not so much worried about cutoffs, stuff like that. Uh, since the time of Wilson, our viewpoint on quantum field theory is that under basically all circumstances, we should regard a quantum field theory as an effective theory. <coughs> valid uh, description, valid below some uh, fundamental scale, physical scale, lambda, that could be the string scale, the lattice length, inverse lat lattice length, it could be the scale where you match onto another quantum field theory. God knows, okay? Uh, but unavoidably, if you have uh, at, at uh, the idea is that a macroscopic uh, quantum system at long enough energy, uh, at long enough distances, will be described by quantum field theory. I don't know if what are the the, the counterexamples of this. Perhaps in condensed matter. Uh, now, in, with, with relativity in, I think it's tougher to. So, for instance, you cannot have limit cycles and stuff like that. But but this is again field theory. So. You, I, 
Anyway, let us know what the field theory looks like it works, okay? And, uh, and uh, so you have, you have here whatever you, you may have, strings or lattice, who knows, space-time foam, whatever, uh, a, new, a new QFT, something else. And, uh, and, then, and then you have uh, all, that, uh, all that is possible basically happens okay you have you have a general Lagrangian and uh, and I'll come back to this comment about all that is possible happens all that is possible is compulsory later on that's precisely related to naturalness <clears throat> and then so you have so you have this fundamental scale and then you 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 perform measurements at any energy scale or length scale I mean energy scale below lambda or length scale longer than one over lambda and uh, I mean, this, the, the case we are interested in, uh, we, we want to focus on, is a case where, where this, effect, this effective field theory has a range of validity, okay? In the sense that if the gap were over the lambda, then that's it, okay, it's the end of the story. Uh, so the scale where, where, the, where our main description will, will have to be uh, changed to a new one is, let me assume it's some IR scale that is much, much, Below or parametrically be below lambda. Uh, I mean, the, this lambda IR could be the scale where there could be a gap. It could be the scale where you transit to a new dynamics. It's, it's certainly the scale where the dynamic the dynamic changes. Okay, you could imagine having it here. If it's a gap, then there's nothing to discuss. If it is the scale where the dynamic changes, then you change the dynamics right away and use another effective field theory. So, anyway. It's interesting to consider the, the situation where you have a separation of, uh, of mass scales. So then, basically by assumption, okay, this situation, what do I have? I have, I have dynamics okay, that emerges on scale lambda, and, uh, and the, next, the next energy scale where something really changes dramatically is way, way below. Okay? So it doesn't mean that in this range, okay, in the range between lambda and lambda IR, uh, the dynamics doesn't change uh, dramatically. In fact, if you want, it's by assumption. But that's our normal okay, view of quantum field theory. The, 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 all the quantum field theories we used in, 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 uh, in particle physics, okay, we have the standard model, we match to the pyro Lagrangian, we match to QED, have precisely this property. There's, there's a physical cutoff, and then the next layer is way below. In the between, the dynamics doesn't change dramatically, which means that the dynamics is approximately scale invariant, okay? So the dynamics in this, in this domain is approximately scale invariant, if you want by definition, okay? Technically, if you, uh, this, this statement can be phrased with the fact that the, the, the dynamics in, in this range is described by a Lagrangian that is, corresponds to a fixed point Lagrangian scale invariant Lagrangian plus uh, a deformation Lagrangian. Uh, and, and the effect of this deformation Lagrangian are small for in the, in the range. Okay. <coughs> so uh, we started talking about Effective field theory, started talking about quantum field theory, we are already talking about approximate scale invariance. Okay? And, uh, and, uh, and you can think of the, of, of the various effective field theories that we use to describe physics starting from the Wii scale down as uh, precisely in these terms. And in those cases, the the fixed, point, the, the, the fixed point Lagrangian is what type of Lagrangian? Eh? Free, right? In the, in, the, in the cases we are used to, the, the, the fixed point Lagrangian is just free, okay? The, 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 well, let me use this. Uh, I don't know whether this is good English. Uh, okay. Uh, 
uh, but uh, and and by the way, the the okay, let me, so the, the, this is the and, and the and the small perturbation normally is dominated by renormalizable couplings. I'll get ba back to this in a moment. Uh, however, uh, uh, the it could be that at a certain point in when when thinking of particle physics problem, we we could open our mind a little bit and think of fixed point Lagrangians that are not free. Okay, it's possible. Uh, well, in condensed matter we have examples. Okay, and we certainly have examples in uh, in theoretical quantum field theory. Okay, and uh, so it could be that we, we have some strongly cut fixed point and it turns out and this is and this is a, a very interesting and important fact that in all the cases in all the relevant cases we know uh, scale invariance okay whether the the scale invariance the, the fixed point is free or interacting scale invariance uh, plus Poincaré invariance together and unitarity together team up to imply a bigger symmetry that is conformal invariance. Okay, so um, so effective field theory, scale separation, approximate scale invariance, and uh, it's just a fact that scale invariance for Poincaré in under all circumstances we, we, we know imply conformal invariance. Certainly that is the case in two dimensions. Of course, I'm not talking about two dimensions. And that was first proven by combined work by Sasha Zamologikov and Joe in the, in the 80s. Okay, so in two dimensions, it's established scale invariance implies conformal invariance. Uh, in four dimensions, the situation was uh, uh, stagnating for uh, for a while. Progress there was progress in the in the last few years uh, as a byproduct of the proof of the A theorem in four dimensions. And uh, well, depends on whom you you ask. They may tell you that it's proven, and or well, there's a very strong indication that it's proven, but it's not proven. And certainly, what is certainly the case is that. If a four-dimensional theory, a unitary four-dimensional Lorentz invariant theory that has scale invariant, not to be conformal invariant would have to be very, very, very peculiar. Okay, there are, and uh, if you want, I can discuss that later on. But so it's it's. Uh, Well, I mean, you very, 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 very roughly, okay? The A theorem established an uh, irreversibility. There's a quantity that flows monotonically, okay? And, uh, and, uh, and uh, the flow of this, of the, if the theory is conformally invariant, the flow of this variable is frozen. It doesn't flow, it stays constant. But if the theory is only scale invariant, this quantity keeps flowing. Okay, and if it keeps flowing, uh, quantities will become infinite. And uh, if you assume the quantities are finite, you get a contradiction. But of course, there could be infinities lying behind this. Okay, so that's if you want a very, very quick and dirty way of saying it. Uh, so uh, there is a very strong indication that even in four dimension, we have conformally, conformally invariant theories. Uh, so in other words, uh, this thing here. Is this okay? So whenever you have we have an effective field theory, an effective field theory is an approximate conformal field theory. So it's we are studying quantum field theory in a neighborhood of a of a conformal fixed point. Okay. So the, the interesting the area of uh, of uh, the, the playground of uh, of uh, model builders that use quantum field theory to attack the problem of particle physics. Is this neighborhood around conformal field theory? This is why the studies of conformal field theories are 
very, very interesting for phenomenologists like me, okay? Speculative phenomenologists, okay? okay? Let me not use the word. I mean, people may get offended, okay? I'm not <laughs> phenomenologist. <laughs> okay. Uh, and uh, so, for instance, and, uh, and it's interesting because for conformity theories, you can say a lot of stuff, okay? You've seen in the talk by, by Simon Duffin. In fact, the statement that that uh, um, scale invariance implies conformal invariance can be made very precise in the neighborhood of a conformal fixed point. So let's just say if there is a conformal fixed point, okay, in the ne in the region around the fixed point where all beta functions are small, there cannot be a, a point uh, where the theory is scale invariant and not conformal invariant. Okay, uh, there can be points that are also conformal invariant, like you have in Bank Zacks. Bank Zacks, uh, there's a small parameter epsilon, so there is a, there's a region very close to the original free fixed point, where there is another fixed point, and that's also conformal. Uh, it has to be conformal. Okay, that's a theorem. Okay. And similarly, in the neighborhood of a, of a CFT, you cannot have cycles. You cannot have a point where the RG flow keeps cycling. You cannot have strange attractors, you cannot have tori, you cannot have, I mean, in the neighborhood of a CFT, the, the flow, the theory either flows to another CFT uh, or flows out of this domain, and God knows what happens, okay? Um, I mean, goes to, 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 a, to in the domain where you need to change your description. Uh, so this is only in the neighborhood of, of a CFT. Of course, what happens very far away, uh, right now, we, we we cannot yet constrain. For instance, can we have cycles that are huge, okay, like this, such a way that in no way the beta functions are small? We don't know, okay? In fact, if you had a situation like that, this would even contradict this idea, okay, that there is a proximate scale invariance. I imagine the theory exits here, and then you have a discrete uh, scale invariance. Uh, after every, say, 2 pi in certain units, it goes back to itself, okay? Um, would be something very, very funny. Oh, please. The, the strategy of the free point here, the four dimensions is that like in CRT, like it's really close to the three dimensions. Well, the strategy is that it's very simple. This assumption that you're close to the CFT fixed point basically reduces the problem to the two dimensional one. Uh, if you're not close to the fixed point, you have to consider two, three, and four point function of T, and that's complicated to see. To, to say that t is zero. But if you are close to the fixed point, then at leading order in an expansion in the beta function, uh, the quantity you have to consider is the two point function, and you deduce the two point function must be zero at that order. Okay? That's basically the strategy. If you want, it's like a two dimension. You prove that the, correlate, the TT correlator is zero. So that's the strategy. Just reduces to the, if you want, if I start doing the two dimensional case, then we go. If you want, we can discuss that later. Okay, if you want, that can be discussed later on uh, in the discussion session. That, But this is a phenomenology talk. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't drag me. <laughs> you see, you're string theorists, okay? <laughs> Please. I know that in, in all relativistic theories, there are cycles. Okay. There's this uh, FM of cycles. Uh, it's like uh, it's the effective theory that describes the interactions uh, of, uh, of three non-relativistic particles, of, of uh, the interaction of relativistic particles in the limit where the scattering length goes to infinity. Uh, close to that point, you, you, you can describe the, the the system in terms of a cycling, uh, yeah, that was studied by even by Wilson, I think. It was, it's uh, so just to be clear, so a bear master is like a part of the sector. There's no such thing as a bear master. I mean, bear. everything is physical. Okay, there's there's, there's a bear. I mean, there's a master here. There's an input parameter, and then there's something. 
you measure, okay? And that what you measure is a function of your input parameters. And that really, call the bare mass term if you want the input parameter, yeah? I don't know, but I mean, for example, yeah. you know, the, the tectonic max of the peaks, for example, okay, that, that's a, I mean, that's some constant that, I mean, yeah, anyway, so this here was considered, because you know, usually when you say the three parts of the theory, you can consider the mass term as well, but in that case, you wouldn't have the steady values. No, the free part, free massless, sorry, free massless. Okay. So okay. sorry, free massless, free mass. Yeah, yeah, free massless, sorry, 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 free massless, free massless, sure, 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 free massless. Actually, I have to speed up. Okay, uh, so um, <coughs> notice uh, something very interesting that happens when you have, uh, when you have uh, this situation and I will just say it in words. Uh, if I write, then it's going to take more time. So let me say it in words. Uh, you have, so you have, you have a fundamental scale, you have a, an infrared scale, and then, and you flow, okay? But basically, your, 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 uh, the physics, okay, is the physics of a fixed point that is conformal, and then as you flow, as you flow down, you, the, the, you, you can picture the mapping between the UV and the IR in terms of energy flow. And uh, you can compute your observables in the infrared by first solving the energy flow. And as you know very well, in a reasonable conformal theory, uh, the number of operators, scalar operators of dimension strictly or, or equal than four is finite. Okay? In fact, uh, and while the the set of operators that mention bigger than four, the relevant operators is infinite. And that set is precisely what contains the, all the complicated structure, all the information about your ultraviolet dynamics. Well, uh, the, the irrelevant operators, as you flow towards infrared, their coefficient effectively flows to zero. And as you, as you approach the infrared, only, only a finite number of, uh, of coefficient uh, remain important, okay? And uh, so this is to say that as you flow towards the infrared, the description simplifies, okay? Uh, it's the same phenomenon that you have when you go, when you look at somebody, and then you start going back and back and back, depending whether, whether you like or not like the person, eventually the person will be a point, okay? And uh, everything will be simplified, okay? Uh, it's the same situation. In fact, it will be a point, it will be a point, and even no matter what the shape of the person, this point will have an accidental additional symmetry, SO3, okay? And uh, uh, this is very much intrinsic in the process of simplification when you go to long wavelength or, or low energy. Uh, within the number of operators that are relevant or marginal, uh, there may not be any operator that transforms under a given global symmetry, okay? So what you can have is what we call accidental symmetries. Just the very existence of a separation of scales implies simplifications and the origin of accidental symmetries. Okay, and uh, and this is a very very important fact to keep in mind when we when we think of uh, of quantum field theory. In this is more in Europe, but uh, I mean, uh, and already when I was uh, gr uh, studying physics, the idea of a normalizability as truly an important principle. Uh, without which you cannot do anything, is totally dis dismantled in this view, okay? Uh, normalizability is to say the description of the Lagrange in terms of operators mentioned is less or equal to four, is just an emergent phenomenon whenever you have a separation of scales. Separation of scales is the essence for uh, the relevance of uh, renormalizable theories in our description. Again, this is a concept that was uh, formalized by by, by Wilson, and uh, and some of the important steps to make it more quantitative, according to our ordinary understanding of renormalization, was again done by Joe in the eighties. Okay, I also do it when you're not around. I also say these things when you're not around. <laughs> so and uh, and um, so so the basic idea that that quantum field theory is simple has symmetries because it's fundamental from this perspective is totally wrong, okay? Uh, quantum field theory is simple as symmetries precisely because it's not fundamental, okay? Uh, is, uh, because we are looking at things from far away, okay? So let me see where I am. Uh, okay, now 
uh, a very important uh, uh, notion uh, in, in all this is, is played by symmetries. Okay? And if you want, uh, it's important because symmetries can arise as accidental symmetries. Okay? But let's consider symmetries in general. Okay. Or perhaps, no, perhaps I'll do this. Actually, do this. So let me come to the second part of this lecture, that is to say, symmetries. Selection rules and naturalness. <coughs> so, in uh, in quantum field theory, we are faced with two classes of symmetries: gauge symmetries. Uh, and here, as you know, these are not uh, symmetries in the in the in the ordinary sense; they are redundancies that are needed to write in manifestly local Lorentz invariant way theories, field theories involving particles with spin higher than one half. Okay? And uh, uh, in that sense, gauge, gauge symmetries can always be viewed as exact. Okay? You can always you make gauge fix, but the, you can always write your theory in a form that, uh, that preserves the gauge symmetry. If you want, if this gauge symmetry is broken, it, uh, if you break it, it just means that you're adding degrees of freedom. Okay, it's just you're you're now writing a drama with more actors. Okay, uh, gauge theory is just the goal of gauge theory is to write a minimalistic drama. Okay, and uh, and uh, apparently nature likes to do that. Okay, and then we have uh, global symmetries. Uh, as far as we understand, in fact, you understand it better than me. In uh, string theory, okay, uh, there are no global symmetries. I don't know how this statement is, but okay, there are no global symmetries. But under many circumstances, there can appear in string theories and in ordinary quantum field theory uh, approximate accidental symmetries. Okay, like in string theory, when you compactify, you have some slight. For some reason, you get a slightly bigger compactification manifold. You covers can come from world sheet instantons. And uh, if particles are localized at different places, you can get exponential suppression of Yukawa coupling, and you have an, an emergent effective chiral symmetry in the low energy Lagrangian. I mean, you can have global approximate symmetries. Okay? These are uh, things that you have quite often, and they play an important role because they play an important role in our understanding uh, observables. Okay? And the, the way global symmetry is global approximate. Okay? Uh, are, are the, the, the magic word by which uh, symmetries are affecting our, our view of physics is selection rules. Okay? Uh, but just to give you an idea of what selection rules are, okay, uh, so the standard example is in atomic physics. So, so selection rules are the set of it's just a, an application of the wigner eckhart theorem to estimate, to, to estimate how a given observable that has certain uh, transformation properties under a given symmetry will depend on a parameter, an external control parameter that is also transforming under that symmetry. Okay? So the, the, the canonical example is in atomic physics in the interaction of atoms with the electromagnetic field, whether static or dynamical. So for instance, in the static case, uh, uh, atom in electric field, constant electric field, the Hamiltonian uh, will be given by the zero order Hamiltonian minus the interaction of the dipole operator times the electric field. And uh, as a result of, of this perturbation by an external vector, uh, the, the energy eigenstates will not have definite angular momentum. You will have mixing, okay, and the mixing uh, of uh, states with different angular momentum in the limit where E is small, sufficiently small, and how, what that means depends on the feature of the atom you are considering. When when E is sufficiently small, uh, the 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 mixing will will be uh, controlled by the suitable power of E associated uh, 
Okay, let me give you an example. Okay, if you have, say, you have, you have, so how can I define the mixing? Let's say you have an energy eigenstate alpha in the presence of, uh, of, uh, of an external field. Uh, the, the, the mixing, let's say a definition of a mixing between uh, states with, with different uh, angular momentum, J, J3, okay, uh, uh, given alpha is a function of E, can be defined to be the following quantity, J, J prime 3, is just the overlap, okay. Uh, Okay, so th this this is just uh, picking up the components in the eigenstate alpha associated with j and j prime, and uh, and uh, you applying applying the wigner eckhart theorem. There are various ways to do it. You can do it when you, just by seeing how which order in perturbation theory you need to go before this quantity is non-zero. Okay, you can prove that this thing. Uh, goes at least like E electric field to the J minus J prime, okay? Uh, so you need at each, to mix levels that have angular momentum different by one, you need to insert one vector, E, two, two vectors and so on and so forth, okay? So that's an example of a selection rule and here E is, is our small parameter. And uh, uh, oh, oh. Of course, if it can happen that you do this estimate and then you go and look at, the, at your physical system and you find that the mixing is much smaller, well, that presumably that means that we have missed uh, some other symmetry, for instance, parity, okay? And you go back and you try to account for it. And in the vast majority of cases, this is, this is why we like physics, okay? We can use uh, these tricks to quickly estimate uh, uh, the size of physical quantity, very much like we were very excited when we learned to do dimensional analysis to estimate like the frequency of the pendulum or stuff like that. And dimensional analysis is just one variety of application of selection rules for dilatations. Okay, you perform dilatations of of the units of measure of, of all your possible observables. Okay? That's just uh, dimensional analysis. Okay. So, however, there can be situations where, where for some reason, this is, is uh, th th this quantity is much smaller than the selection rule suggests, and there's no symmetry we can look for uh, to explain for that, and we call the situation a tuned situation. In other words, for some reason, we concocted our system, or we went through the periodic table, and we chose in this periodic table that one out of a hundred elements for which this coefficient here, instead of being one, is point oh one okay there is they say, they say they are distributed there is one for some reason okay so the Mendeleev table is a sort of landscape okay you can go around you can pick I mean this is really condensed matter done by somebody who doesn't know anything okay so but this is but you can view it this way okay and uh, but normally uh, you don't get any dramatic uh, effect you don't get 10 to the minus 10 you can get 10 to the minus 20 okay uh, at least I don't know of any example Okay, so this is why selection rules are famous. Okay. Now, uh, this reasoning uh, applies uh, equally well to quantum field theory. Okay. Uh, so, and it's at the heart of the notion of naturalness that was introduced by Toft in the 70s. Okay. So, uh, in, in, in quantum field theory, we can think, just to simplify a little bit, mentally what we want to do. You can think of the theory at the scale of, of the IR scale, okay, and you want to do, you want to compute some observable having to do with physics at, at this scale or below, okay, so that you're far away or, or even far, far away from, from the cutoff, just not that this is necessary, but just to, to concentrate on a finite number of, of, uh, of couplings, okay, perhaps if the experimental precision is not good enough, you can you can forget all the relevant ones, just focus on the marginal and the relevant if they exist. And we will later on try to understand better. But uh, so let's, let's, let's uh, so there's gonna be at, 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 the, at, the, at the given scale we're considering, 
the, our quantum field theory will have a certain number of parameters. And we can view, oftentimes, in fact, basically always, we can always view these parameters as the expectation values of fields that we call spurions, okay, that, that somehow uh, transform under <coughs> the global symmetries of our system, restoring them formally. I think uh, the notion of uh, couplings as fields, if I'm not, uh, I, I, I think that Nati Cyber used it in his lectures, uh, right? So uh, you, you're even familiar with super fields, coupling as super fields, not just fields, okay? So, so, and, uh, and uh, so under the circumstances, there's gonna be some, that's often the case, you, you have a global symmetry group G, and under this group G, these couplings transform in a given way, and assuming there's a certain amount of smallness in these couplings, okay, I, here I'm being a little bit fuzzy in the discussion, okay, I'm, uh, um, then you, you, you uh, I mean, under, un, under, if you can treat them as small and there is some conditionality, but that's not really needed, you, you expect observables, this is just to simplify the discussion, can be written as polynomials in these couplings, okay? That, that's often the case when you have like flavor transitions, you have com contributions from Yukawa couplings, mixing angles and so on, so polynomials in these quantities. And uh, <coughs> so given, given the coupling and given a certain observable, okay, uh, uh, this observable will, you, you can compute this observable in, in, in this, effective theory, and uh, in a sense, by an incarnation of uh, Gelman's uh, dictatorial uh, principle that all that can happen in quantum field theory must happen, okay? Uh, the system will explore all possible trajectories, all possible ways to contribute to this observable. So you will have that, that you, it's like the double slit experiment. You will have that the observable, that it's the sum overall possible contribution or amplitudes of individual amplitudes, okay? And each individual amplitude uh, or individual contribution to the observable can be written as, as uh, some uh, C, some coefficient, Ci, uh, lambda uh, uh, I, uh, I lambda I n uh, to some power and i and n okay so there can be some uh, and the and the way this the, these powers enter okay uh, is fixed fixed by symmetry and and the simplest possible symmetry you can you you certainly can can use as a and and the, and, and this fixed by symmetry and it's fixed by transformation properties of this observable and the simplest possible symmetry that that you that you normally use in this game is let's see whether you're following eh? scale invariance okay it's just dimensional analysis okay uh, d o is equal to the dimension of co of this lambda, ta, 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 ta. okay? So that's just, uh, dimensional analysis is just this applying the selection rules of dilatations, okay? And, uh, and, uh, and uh, very much like in the case before, you, you can think of two situations. You can think of the situation where if there is a disparity of contributions that have different sizes, uh, this is, if there is one that is biggest, th there is one that is biggest than all the others, uh, if O experimentally is of the order of O maximum, which is equal defined to be the maximum of I of the OI, I, I'm formalizing things that are ridiculous. I mean, it's perhaps ridiculous to formalize these things, but uh, let me do it, okay? So in, if the experimentally observed quantity is of the order of the maximal co contribution, you yes, then you say, okay, then the situation is natural. If, on the contrary, what you measure experimentally is way, way smaller than the maximal contribution, 
uh, then, then there are two options. One is that you have forgotten some symmetry, that there is some correlation between, uh, that there's something that you're, you, that you're really missing, that some of these amplitudes are not independent, they are correlated to one another by some other symmetry that exchanges the various lambdas, okay? And uh, you will have to understand that, and perhaps you will find that when you, when, you, when you take that into account, you end up in the first case, and then the situation is again natural. Or it could happen that you cannot really think of a symmetry that realizes that, and that, just, that this just happens because one or two, I mean two or three or more of the maximal contributions just conspire to cancel one another, okay? And the situation is, is uh, not satisfactory, okay? And this is what we call a natural situation. Okay. So now, uh, now this is, this is the case where, where you are, let's say, I, I just consider the, 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 the simplifying situation where you are in a theory with a finite number of parameters, you're just forgetting all the irrelevant ones. But you can apply the same reasoning to the very theory itself, okay? You can apply, can apply the same reasoning, can apply the same reasoning, let's say you, you have your cutoff here, okay? You can apply the same reason, and here you have your theory is defined by some approximate CFT plus uh, sum over i, lambda i, or i. I mean, these are operators now. These are not observables. Uh, let me put a hat, okay? So these are not, uh, you have an infinite series of operators. Now, you can view these coefficients here, the coefficients of the operators of my effective Lagrangian, themselves as observables, okay? As observables, I mean, they are the observables of my infrared theory. You can, I can compute everything using them, modulo, redundancies, or stuff like that, but they are, you can view themselves as observables, and they are presumably, I mean, they are, I mean, in, in our idea of effective theory, of quantum field theory as, as effective, functions, okay, uh, of, the, of the parameters of the more fundamental theory. And then you can ask yourself, very much like in that case, whether given a certain theory that is given to you by nature, I mean, people have, experimentalists have measured, okay, there are the coefficients there, and now it's up to you to look at this Lagrangian and try to, to smell it, to see what, what, uh, what the deal with it. And, uh, and uh, one question you can ask yourself is whether any pattern of or any part in the structure of this set of couplings lambda i, for instance, some smallness of some classes of couplings, is compatible with selection rules of some hypothetical symmetry that you can assign to the more fundamental theory. Okay, so whether whether you can explain any 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 features in this uh, in this in this set of couplings very much like you you would explain it here. Okay, here uh, in a natural case. Uh, if you are in a natural situation, then the, the size of your exponential quantity is really controlled in a, in a simple way by the size of your lambdas. And uh, if this observable becomes small, that's in one-to-one -one correlation with the lambdas becoming small. While on the other hand, in the case of an unnatural situation, the observable may be small, but the couplings themselves that are responsible, that, that in general break the symmetries, that control that observable may not be small, and that's unnatural. So you can ask yourself whether 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 a given Lagrangian is su su satisfying this criterion, and this criterion is the is the Toth naturalness criterion. Okay, in the please. Yeah, here <laughs> the assumption I made here is that the CIs are order one. Okay. In specific cases, let's say if you have loop diagrams, they are one over sixteen pi squares, and, but they are order one. They're, they're, they're not real. They're not really these parameters. Okay, they're, they just come from the. If you want, 
If I have a strongly coupled CFT, these CIs are from the 3, 4 point function of the CFT. And these are just numbers, okay? Of course, it could be that the CFT itself has some tiny numbers in it, okay? And that's the CFT itself has been tuned. Okay, the, the <laughs> you see, this thing <laughs> goes in this slippery slope, okay? If you have a man, if you have a, uh, if you have a, a landscape of CFTs, there could be cancellations there at that level, so yeah. You, you could choose, okay, if you have a Mendeleev table of 10 to the 8 million CFTs, then you can choose some cases where. Th there can be many, there can be more than one, there can be more than one, yeah, the maximum can be, is like uh, Mont Blanc and Mont Rose, they're more or less the same, okay, it's like, it can be several peaks, okay, comparable, okay, <coughs> not necessarily, okay. So and notice that in this situation, and given the discussion before, I, I, I think it's clear that the, the smallness of any parameter, of class of parameters, okay, if it's way, way, way small, for some reason it's very, very small, must be associated with the presence of the symmetry. So in other words, uh, in order for, 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 for this to be natural. Okay, that's precisely according to this. Okay, a small, under these circumstances, under the natural under, under the first class, that is to say, a natural situation, a small quantity, a small observable, is associated with small, uh, small parameters breaking the specific symmetry. Okay, so the natural situation here is tough naturalness. Okay, uh, uh, smallness. Lambda i. So if you want, this is, an, uh, it is a criterion, okay? It's, it's an ideology, if you want. That's precisely what it is, okay? Small, smallness of given parameter or class or set or subset must be associated, is always, okay? with symmetry. That is to say, in, a, in a, even more, in a, in a uh, let me say it, uh, necessarily if you want, uh, uh, when this, a, a class of, of uh, a parameter, a class of parameters can be naturally small, uh, this necessarily implies that when you set these parameters to zero, you've gained an additional symmetry, okay? <clears throat> so that's tough naturalness. And let me give you, let me give you a, a feeling for that, okay? Uh, le, 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 let me show you how we argue, we, we model builders, phenomenologists, uh, in this, okay? So I'll give you an example. An example is, let's take a, uh, for instance, a, a theory where there is two vile fermions, let me call them like two neutrinos, u1 this slash u1 plus u2 this slash u2, and then you have a scalar, d phi square, and then you have interactions, let me forget for a moment the mass of the scalar, okay? Uh, and then you have interaction like lambda 1, 1, uh, you have phi, you have interaction with 1, 1, 1, 2, Okay, so you have sort of you have interactions, and and then, and then a, qu a question you may ask. Okay, let's say given a experimentalist have measured this Lagrangian, and and they've measured lambda one two and lambda two two for some reason, and the question is how how small can we tolerate lambda one one compatibly with the criterion of naturalness I, I introduced before? Well, let's see what are what symmetries we can, we can think of. Okay, and the symmetry we can think of is just the u one cross u1, uh, under which uh, u1 rotates and u2, uh, I mean, this rotates. This is the u1 number, this is the u2 number, okay? And under the symmetries, uh, let me just say it here, u1, 1, u1, 2, uh, u1, u2, lambda 1, 2, lambda 2, 2, 
lambda 1 1 uh, here you have 1 0 0 1 1 1 1 2 2 0 okay so according to this to this symmetry okay uh, uh, we can put together a combination of lambda 1, 2, and lambda 2, 2, and form an object that has the same quantum numbers of lambda 1, 1. I mean, lambda 1, 1 transforms, uh, me, I don't know how to say it, it's equivalent from the transformation property from symmetry, from the symmetry point of view, not, I'm not yet saying quantity. Oh, sorry, sorry, zero. Sorry, yes. Uh, so lambda 1, 1 has the same quantum number as lambda 1, 2 square, lambda 2, 2 star, okay? And uh, so, uh, grossly you would think, well, if, if I measure these two guys, I would expect that uh, on general grounds, uh, lambda 1, 1 cannot be smaller than, than the quantity of this order, give or take coefficients of order 1 or pi's and stuff like that. And how you... Can you be sure of this, or can you test this hunch, or this whatever, whatever call it, no matter how you want, or it's probably time to use the, this terrible tool. Uh, <laughs> no, probably I can go, I can go, I can do this, I still have space. Uh, I still have space. So, and uh, you can check your guess by, by looking at quantum corrections within the effective theory, okay? So a fortiori, uh, that's, that, that these are a subset of the quantum corrections. You may be missing even bigger effects, but certainly this exists. And if you take, for instance, this diagram like this, oh, this goes up, this is phi, this is one, this is two, this is two, and this is uh, lambda, two. so th this is a uh, lambda two, two star, this is lambda 1, 2, this is lambda 1, 2, okay? And this gives you a correction when you, when you, when you flow from the RG, in, from the UV to the IR, it gives you a correction to lambda 1, 1, that is of order 1 over 16 pi square, uh, lambda 1, 2 square, lambda 2, 2 star, log of lambda over mu, where mu is the infrared scale. And, uh, of course, this, in a sense, has n may have nothing to do with with what I was telling you before about the ultraviolet theory, but certainly if an effect of this type exists at scales of order of lambda, it's hard to imagine that they will not exist, I mean, in the theory. And anyway, there could even be bigger effects, okay? But certainly this is, is a, a minimal effect you expect to have, so it's, it's uh, according to naturalness, you declare that you don't expect uh, lambda 1, 1 to be significantly smaller than this, modulo of factors of pi, cannot be 30 orders of magnitude smaller than this, okay? It's hard to, it's hard to understand, okay? So that's an example. And uh, as a little exercise, you can consider this, this, the, the, this other theory. Oh, here, I, I neglected the case of, uh, of scalar mass. I will discuss that in a moment. You can consider these other examples where you have only scalars and you have, uh, let's forget the masses for a moment, and you have the analog, 1, 1, phi 1 to the fourth, 1, 2, phi 1 square, phi 2 square, plus lambda 2, 2, phi 2 to the fourth, okay? Here you don't have any chiral symmetry. Still, I am willing to say that I can, I can find a symmetry uh, and by similar arguments as the one I just made, I can say that lambda 1, 1 uh, must be less than order lambda 1, 2 square. Uh, Modulo factors of pi. There's a symmetry protecting that, uh, explaining this, this, uh, this relation. And it's just a little exercise to find it. Uh, uh, let me tell you that just, just uh, for fun, that free field theory has infinitely many symmetries. Okay, this is where you have to dig, okay. Okay, so, so and these are the normally, these are the working, the, 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 if you want, this is the practitioning that, that, that we model builders use, okay. That, 
uh, like it or not, this, this is the way it works. And uh, uh, there is one very important uh, there's, there's one very important thing that is imp that I want to really emphasize, and I really see that I'm already behind my my schedule very very dramatically. <laughs> but let me let me tell you uh, let me let me give you a a, a slogan okay right now. <coughs> so if okay, top naturalness. If I, if I had to explain tough naturalness to people in condensed matter, how would I go about and tell them, oh, there is symmetries, and they say, well, well, well. I mean, who ordered these symmetries, okay? So, I mean, uh, okay, if, if these things are small, then this is small and small accordingly, but why, why were lambda 1, 2, or lambda 2, two small in the first place, okay? I, if you want, this is maybe B, your, your, the symmetries you, you you're assuming here that the structure of the coupling is self-consistent. Okay, a structure of coupling compatible with tough naturalness may be self-consistent, but the fact is, uh, of course, and that's way, way better than a structure that is not self-consistent. Okay, that's very implausible, but that doesn't yet uh, explain it. Okay, why, why, wh where does the symmetry come from? Okay, wh why is it there? And of course, after all, I told you before, uh, we have sort of answer for that. The, the idea is that the symmetries may arise as approximate symmetry from the previous life of our theory. In other words, from the structure the theory has at scales even shorter. The, you can think of at scale higher than lambda, there's been another layer where lambda is the infrared scale, and there's a bigger lambda prime even above. And in the flow between lambda prime and lambda, you have had this purification, simplification of the theory, and the uh, accidental symmetries have emerged. In other words, it could be that one view is that the accidental symmetries, the, the, the approximate symmetries of today are the accidental symmetries of tomorrow. Okay? <laughs> and a, an example of this is, for instance, think of, think of Fermi theory. Fermi theory is the theory that describes the interaction of, well, he, 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 at the time he, he was looking at neutron decay, but uh, the, 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 the Lagrangian describing the interaction between uh, muons, electrons, and neutrinos, okay, there's a Fermi interaction for Fermi interaction, uh, there's only one chirality of neutrino, uh, the electron and the muon have a mass, but the neutrinos don't have a mass, okay, and people in, I don't know what people were thinking in those days, I mean, uh, the neutrino is massless, okay, and uh, uh, Majorana probably would have said, okay, why is it massless, okay? I can write a mass for sure. I can certainly write a mass, a Majorana mass, okay? And then probably they said, well, okay, there's a symmetry. There's a very important symmetry of nature, lepton number. Uh, the only mass you can write down breaks lepton number. And uh, lepton C, lepton number is a fundamental symmetry of nature. Let's impose it, and that's it. So in fact, that's not even approximate. That's truly an exact symmetry at that stage. But what's the origin of lepton number, okay? wait a few decades, go to the standard model, and now you are at the next layer, you're looking at the theory at scales above the weak scale, and what, and what do you have in this theory? If, uh, in, in this theory now, the neutrino is part of a bigger structure, an SU2 doublet, uh, in order to generate a mass, according to, to the presence of this, of this structure, you need to have the neutrino talk to the Higgs, okay? And the Higgs is a doublet, and the only way to have the neutrino talk to the doublet is via an irrelevant operator. Okay? So neutrino mass uh, is uh, H Higgs lepton doublet square divided by uh, some scale. Okay? It's probably close to the gut scale, 10 to the 14. In fact, this, this is another remarkable thing that what we observe in neutrino masses is compatible with this scale where everything seems to m want to go. Okay, a scale that is a few decades between 10 to the 14 and 10 to the 18. So, okay, so th th that's an example of, uh, and similarly, if I will say it in a moment, I'll probably say it tomorrow, uh, okay, I'll, 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 I'll say this later on, okay? So, but aside the example like this, there are, uh, in, in theories, uh, let me give you another example that is very, very important for all that follows. Uh, I think I can make it. I think I can make it. Uh, I'm afraid I have to do this. Okay. 
Now let's see how I, because yesterday when I was seeing you guys doing it, I was not happy from the way, uh, you see? <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I'm even worse. It's fun, uh, uh, because I was saying, oh, they're keeping too much water. But, but it's the same. I'm doing exactly the same. So. That's fun. Oh. And then. Yeah, too bad that what I'm going to write now is crap, sorry. <laughs> 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 That's always the case. It's like the, it's the beauty. And <laughs> so now, 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 now we come to an example, OK? Uh, uh, that is the centerpiece, if you want, of all gibberish on BSM. Let's take a theory of, of a scalar field, OK? Uh, like phi to the fourth, OK? Uh, we can add a mass term, we can add uh, a quartic interaction, we can add more, okay? And now the relevant question is how small can we tolerate? Let's say given lambda, how small can we tolerate m compatible with naturalness, okay? And here what is the relevant symmetry? The relevant symmetry is 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 a shift symmetry in the limit where lambda, let's say, let's forget this, let's forget m, in the limit where lambda vanishes, okay, of course everything else should vanish, okay, all the other terms, but let's focus just on lambda. Uh, in the limit where lambda goes to zero, oh no, this doesn't go up, now I'm stuck. Uh, we acquire a symmetry, a shift symmetry, okay, uh, so. Uh, Phi is what you would call a Goldstein boson. Okay, that's the symmetry, and uh, and the symmetry for B it's any interaction involving that does not involve the derivative of phi. Okay, so according to the symmetry, phi must only have derivative interaction. Now phi to the fourth is a non-derivative interaction, and then <coughs> by again by Gelman uh, totalitarian principle, this lack of invariance under derivative interaction will propagate everywhere in all possible ways. Okay. Uh, and as uh, you can estimate very much as we did before, what you expect, you would expect generically, naively, okay, uh, it's, it's not easy to do it right away with selection rules, but let me, let me just do it in the, in the, in the, in the correct way, although the discussion is, is, is not as neat as that. Uh, you expect that this M will have to be certainly uh, if lambda is non zero, there's some power of lambda that will intervene in controlling the size of m, okay? And, and, uh, but lambda is dimensionless, so you, you must introduce the next, the other parameter you have in your theory. Remember, the, the scale lambda is a physical scale, okay? So, according to the selection rules of dilatations, you expect this parameter to be there precisely this way, okay? And so you expect that this is basically the relation, okay? The mass should be bigger than that. And, and you can check that this is precisely what you obtain when you compute one loop corrections in the effective theory. This one loop correction is not calculable within the effective theory, but it indicates uh, what, what to expect, right? You get a correction to the mass that goes like lambda over 16 pi square, some integral, dp square, that of course the integral uh, is not calculable within the effective theory, uh, normally, this is called the quadratic divergence. I don't want even to insist on that. Okay, we don't know uh, the, the 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 coefficient, but clearly there's no reason why this should be should be not equal to of order lambda square. Okay, that's if you want selection rules tell us that this should be of order lambda square. There's n nothing else. Okay, there's nothing else. Uh, in particular, you cannot use scale invariance. Okay, because scale invariance is broken by lambda itself. Okay, so normally. Often you have statements that you could use scale invariance as a symmetry to protect uh, the mass, but 
in the relevant case, scaling variance is broken in the maximal possible way by the presence of a physical cutoff. So this is what you expect. And this is the well-known uh, Wilsonian horror for, for, uh, for, massless, for light scalars. Okay? And that's well known to people working in condensed matter laboratories, where in order to set their system, or equivalent system, to the point where the equivalent quantity of, of the scalar mass is, is zero, they have to hire a very good lab technician by saying the analog in three dimension, the Ising model in three dimension, that's water at the critical point. Uh, you really have to tune your parameters of pressure and temperature to be precisely at the critical point in order to have this parameter vanishing. In other words, <coughs> uh, you need to tune, OK? Unless lambda is very, very small. In that case, you have a Goldstone boson. But if lambda is very, very small, the interaction of these objects are very, very different than an ordinary scale. It's only coupled derivatively. OK. okay. Uh, I'm afraid I am done, OK? Because now I was at the moment of making my point, OK? After all this long discussion, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the point, I will make it uh, tomorrow, OK? That's, it's already clear where I'm going, OK, in terms of time, OK? The point I want to make now is the question I want to ask now, and it's the, this question is invited by, by, by this case here, is OK? Uh, I'm done. I, 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 I finish in two, in, in two minutes. Uh, I, I just say this thing. Eh? <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just saying that. I'm just saying that um, uh, from the point of view of the effective theory, the next layer, the infrared scale itself, okay, this this IR scale here, lambda IR is a function of the couplings at the cutoff, particularly will be some combination of your original parameters. Could be, in weakly coupled theories, just basically the mass of the scalar of, of, of some field you have there. And, and the question is whether, again, whether this quantity, which is just a particular combination of parameters, whether its smallness is natural according to the criterion I was discussing before. And you can identify overall two situations I thought he had many more that uh, you had like six or eight, but at least in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, let's say that in theories, but I think we can go back on that. In the theories that are relevant for phenomenology, relativistic quantum field theory, there are basically two situations where this separation of scale is natural, okay? And, uh, and I call these two scenarios, one is marginality and the other is symmetry, okay? And these two cases that are the only two we have been able to think of correspond also to the two scenarios to address the hierarchy problem that we mainly been able to think of, that is compositeness and supersymmetry. And uh, that's it. OK, thank you. No, I don't, I don't think there's any way. I don't think there's any way. No. But think of it. Think of it. If you find it, that it would be. I don't think there is any way. Um, I mean, you. You 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 need something that. Uh, let's say that. Well, in general, in general, you can you can have a situation where you have a, another parameter that transforms. So let me put this way: yes, in a sense, but that's not interesting. You have lambda, okay, and then you have a phi plus another parameter, call it a vev, to the fourth, and this shift and that shift. That's it. Okay, in a sense, you're cooked. Okay, this. Parameter. Okay, the, the formally you have the symmetry, but a parameter that introduced that restores the symmetry is not small. In the it's a dimensionful parameter with the so the only scale you have is lambda. So this parameter is expected to be lambda, unless 
unless this parameter itself transforms under some symmetry. So why is it considered natural for the coupling to be of order one and why is that the being a coupling of order one doesn't mean anything. Okay. Depends on the fact that you have chosen natural units. H bar equal one. If couplings were of order one, then loop expansion parameters would be of order one. Strictly speaking, so so let me let me say a, a couplings. I mean, you should look at loop expansion parameters. Loop expansion parameters are the truly physical quantity that is uh, independent of the normalization of h bar. When you scale h bar in your Lagrangian, so you you have you have you have uh, the path integral, you have d phi e to the i s over h bar. Okay, rescaling h is like, is like rescaling the coupling in such a way that this quantity is, is invariant. So the, the, the couplings are not that, they're not of order one. They happen to be of order, say, in the standard model, they range from, at the weak scale, they range from, for the electron, this is 10 to the minus 10, to the top, this is 10 to the minus 2. So you're asking me why? Yeah, I mean, basically, why, why, why this number? No, 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 no. No, no, but that's a good question. Why is the loop expansion <laughs> parameter, <laughs> why is the loop expansion parameter 1 in 100? That's a good question. Why? String theorists. <laughs> this is a question for string theorists. I know that that's the, that's the hierarchy problem. No, 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 no. It's a question for string theorists. Imagine, <laughs> imagine, imagine, sorry, can, sh should I stop or? Uh, Okay, so uh, it could be that this 1 over 100, over 30, say for the gauge coupling, is 1 over the log of the separation from the string scale and the weak scale. So imagine, uh, imagine you have, a, at the string scale, you, you match onto a theory that is infrared free. But the string scale is maximally coupled. The dilaton is stabilized at the self uh, uh, dual point. Okay, the, the string theory is strongly coupled irremediably. There's no perturbation theory, and uh, <coughs> and uh, but it, it it happens that some some uh, so and, and then couplings emerge as large or their uh, loop expansion parameter are order one. But then then you have uh, say. Uh, 4 pi over alpha uh, uh, in the I, mu ir is 4 pi over alpha mu uv uh, plus some coefficient of order 1 that is the beta function coefficient log mu ir mu uv. Okay, that's, and, and this is of order 1. So now <coughs> if, if, but that's again, uh, if you if this is one, because the theory is only coupled there, if we know that the separation here is, say, 10, 20 orders of magnitude, then this, this loop expansion parameter here is one in 20. So the one in 20, one in 50 may be just the result of that. Now, the question is, if all couplings are of order one, where the hell is this big log coming from? Okay, uh, Because then everything is there, so then Perhaps some some S O thirty two is perhaps there are some large numbers in the in the structure itself of uh, the, the theory has some n but n of order uh, a few and there is some coupling that at that scale starts of order w one over twenty so like the QCD coupling and then that one grows and when that one becomes order one then you have gone again through about twenty orders of magnitude in the log so. That I cannot. I'm sorry. I cannot do any better than this. But that's sorry. That's not my fault. I mean, uh, uh, so that is what could account for the size of the couplings. Then the, the Yukawa's is a different story. But you didn't need string theory after all. Eh? You did not need string theory after all. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> well, okay. If you're happy with that, then you don't need it. <laughs> depends. <laughs> depends on your on your. Uh, I mean, it's hard to make this thing.